and that's actually really the, the systematic understanding of the anatomy of the brain. And in that sense, Henry shares um, one feature, at least, with Jesus that we have to <laughs> emphasize. There's only one, the rest I cannot say much about, but that is the singularity of purpose. Right? So, so Henry has, throughout his career, very systematically focused just on largely on this one question, how is the brain really wired? And he has gone through this with all possible techniques that are available to really <coughs> at the lowest possible level that allows a high fidelity reconstruction description of brain anatomy. And that makes a really outstanding <coughs> if you want, example of how we should think about the brain in terms of this wired physical system. And Henry is one of the few experts in the world who has a really deep understanding of this, especially with respect to the the neocortex of, of the mouse and the rat and macaque monkey. So it's great to have Henry here. Henry, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. Go for it. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizers, Paul and, and, and Tony and Anna, for uh, allowing me to come back again in, in this uh, wonderful city. It's, it's uh, very vibrant, as they say. Um, so when Paul invited me, he asked me to talk about Haraku processing. And last night at dinner, um, people were saying uh, we shouldn't be presenting what we've already published. We should kind of go out of the, go out of the box and, and present things which we were trying to publish, because publishing can be quite an agonizing ordeal, and it sometimes takes quite a while. So I went back from this wonderful dinner rather early, and um, having had quite a lot of red wine, and, uh, and sort of changed my slides around. So I'm going to do something a little different from what I uh, originally had proposed, but I will come back to hierarchical processing. But what I want to talk about is, so it's unpublished, a lot of it's unpublished. I'm really very, very surprised. In the introduction that Paul gave you, he mentioned the work I'm doing on connectivity, and uh, that has been a preoccupation for a long time. But I have another interest, which is corticogenesis. It's the development of the cortex. And uh, with Colette de Hay, we've been doing this now for a number of years in macaque. And one of the results of that is to show that actually the developing cortex in primates is actually very, very different from the development of the rodent cortex. Uh, and in fact, it, to such an extent that you um, really cannot think of the, of the rodent cortex as a model from primate, including human development. There's a lot of work now being done on, on the development of the human cortex for all sorts of obvious reasons, because a lot of the genes which are expressed during development have serious consequences for um, uh, neurological function and dysfunction. And, and so my mindset is enormously that actually it's not that easy to generalize from primates, including humans, to other species. And of course, other species are enormously uh, studied in laboratories. And so a warning signal is be careful about what you believe you know about connectivity by referring back to other species. And so um, this is all to say that if I had been uh, doing this kind of talk, which I'm going to be talking about today last year, I would have had a very different prediction about what our results have been. And these results, which I'm going to be talking about, concerns comparing the principles of connectivity of the mouse neocortex, or isocortex, and the connectivity of the macaque cortex. And what I'll be showing you is that, in fact, there's a lot of similarity. And that is what has enormously surprised me. I'll, I'll be making, a, 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 that would be the, the crux of what I want to talk about. And why do I want to make that comparison? Well, one of the intriguing things about uh, changes in the size of the cortex is we know that this has a big impact on general features of connectivity. As brains get bigger, the number of connections decreases. The number of connections per cortical area has to decrease. And if you think about that, that in itself is a very strange constraint because what, you, what brains are into, they're into connectivity. Large numbers of connections. The whole thing is very slow, but the number of connections is huge. And 
you make brains bigger because you want to have more neurons and you want to have more connections. But the cost of wiring is such that you actually have to reduce the number of connections. So if my brain was built with the same amount of wire uh, per neuron as a mouse brain, it would be like a bathtub. So you, you'd be right off the scale. You couldn't come through the door. You would have to have a completely different body to carry this bathtub around. You'd have to have a completely different evolution. So what, what's going on here in the scaling properties is that as brains get bigger, the amount of wire goes down. And people have known this for a long time. But it's only been very recently that we've been able to come back to this with any kind of precision, thanks to the uh, development of novel techniques by Hercule Anahuzo and John Cass, where they've been, and John Cass was here last year, uh, where they've been able to, to make measurements about the numbers of neurons and then relate this to the amount of white matter that you have in, in the brains of different species. And what this shows is that the scaling feature of primates, so that's monkeys and humans and chimpanzees, the scaling features of primates are very different from rodents. When the rodent brain gets bigger, so when you go from a, a mouse with a brain of less than a gram to a capybara, these South American very big rodents, which they roast, apparently, and they, they have hot dogs made out of this in, in, when they have festivals and things. I, I've, I've been told. I don't know. But, so you have these great big rats that are as big as sheep there. And when you compare the brain of the, of the, of this, uh, across these different sizes, what you notice is that as the brain gets bigger, the size of the neurons increase. This has been known for a long time. But the difference between the primates is very radical because as primate brains get bigger, the size of the neurons increase, but much less, proportionally much less. The result of that is that as primate brains get bigger, the number of neurons increases hugely. So in fact, if we want to put human beings back in the center of the picture, which is always a sort of a, a subconscious drive that we have, uh, the, the human brain has the largest number of neurons. It's not the largest of brains, but it's got the largest numbers of neurons. So two very different design features here between the rodents and between the primates. So comparing, if you want to say, you, wa you want to know how does connectivity change with brain size, comparing rodents and uh, primates, you're comparing two different things by doing a mouse and a, and a macaque. You're comparing a small brain with a big brain, but you're comparing a rodent to a primate. Uh, now, the other feature which is going to be important in this story is the folding of the brain. The brain becomes folded, and this is going to act upon distances. And if you act upon distances, you're acting upon the total amount of wire. And, and the arguments I'm going to be putting forward is that is a critical feature. So the mouse brain is a smooth brain, no folding. The macaque brain is folded. So we're making big comparisons here. I mean, we're making a big leap, which is maybe a problem with the, with the comparison I'm making. Why, am I make, why do I want to make this? Well, um, when I came last year, and I'll go back over this this, this year, um, we've been interested in the last four or five years in looking at the general principles of connectivity in the cortex. And traditionally, I say traditionally, over the last 15 years, there's been a strong uh, um, uh, argument in favor of understanding connectivity of the cortex and the brain in purely topological terms. Um, we've argued that this is actually not a very interesting way to go forward. And we've argued in favor of thinking about the spatially embedded features of the cortex. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that if you want to understand the general principles of the cortex, the strength of the connection and the distance over which the connection is acting upon is a key feature to understanding the general principles. So having said that, without saying any more, the comparison across brains of different sizes, given what I've told you is happening to the 
the wiring minimization when you do that is a key feature to testing our theory about the importance of the spatially embedded network as a feature which is highly predictive in terms of understanding uh, a number of features. So this might be all a little bit um, a little garbled. I'm going to unpack it. I will point out what, what's published and what's not published. And then um, when I've gone through these differences, comparing the, the, the mouse and the macaque is a way of understanding these general features and looking, about, looking at what it is that we mean by spatial embedding and why that's important. I'll come back to actually what physiologists are much more interested in, which is referred to as hierarchical processing. Now, what is hierarchical processing? Hierarchical processing is one way of approaching the issue of how you integrate the processing which is done at the local scale with the global dynamics of the cortex. So if you look at the connectivity of the cortex, it turns out that something like 85% of connections are within one or two millimeters of the point that you're, you're interested in. So if you're looking at area V1, the connectivity to a point in area V1, the primary visual area, 85% of the input to that point comes from area V1. Uh, 75% of the rest of it comes from the adjacent area. And it turns out that the 40 or 50 other areas projecting to degree one that we've been studying for many years, us and other people, actually, actually reflects a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the total connectivity. So the, the hierarchical processing is one way of what I refer to as hierarchical processing is one way of grappling with the uh, anatomical signatures of the long distance inter-aerial connectivity in terms of this local connectivity. And I think it's a... Henry, that the feature is also amplified in macaques versus rodents? Yeah. Or that is uniform? There's a, there's a lot of uniformity there. I'm not going to be going into comparing across species, but there is a, 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 a lot of work done by Andreas Burkhalter and others showing that some of the uh, understanding that people have had about hierarchical processes in macaques and, and humans is applicable also to rodents. So I'm going I'm to plod my way through that, and then to terminate, I will come back to making a suggestion of how can we bring, how can we bring these two levels of understanding. On the one side, this spatial embedding that I would have been talking about, this large-scale model of the cortical connectivity, with the hierarchical processing, and I'll make a very simplistic suggestion along those lines. So that's the, um, that's the, that's the plan. Um, so the title of my talk could be The Brain in Space. And what I mean by that, but it's sort of a bit sexy and it's a bit intriguing and you don't quite understand what it's all about, but it, it actually is to emphasize this notion of spatial embedding. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the connectivity between regions of the cortex. This notion that there's a regionalization has been developed since way before the last century. We know that there's different regions, and these different regions can be uh, characterized in terms of their cytoarchitecture, in terms of their connectivity, and in terms of their physiology. We believe that there's a localization of function. We believe that vision is dealt with in one part of the cortex audition in another part, and motor organization in yet another part. And in fact, we believe that there's constellations of these visual areas, auditory areas, somatosensory areas, motor areas, and cognitive function. But there's a, a high degree of notion of localization. So what we're talking about here is the connectivity between cortical areas, an area dealing with the motor function, how does it speak to an area dealing with the visual function, etc. So you can you can drill down there and ask questions about the connectivity of individual neurons. How does an individual neuron in area 46 interact with an individual neuron in area V1? That's a perfectly valid question. It doesn't, it's not the question I'm going to be directly addressing here. So we're interested in the interaction between cortical areas by means of interaerial connections. And um, one of the things that Paul did ask me to address, and I'll just uh, 
briefly refer to it now. Um, if I'm giving this talk in front of Murray Sherman, he always stands up at the end of the talk and says, but Henry, you're not talking about the thalamus because the thalamus is where it all happens. So Murray and, and, uh, and uh, Ray Guillory and, and their, their students have put forward this, this intriguing idea that communication between cortical areas can equally go from the cortex, projecting down into the thalamus, which projects back up into the cortex. It's a very convincing idea. There's a lot of physiology, there's a lot of anatomy, and the idea is, is out there, and it's, it's been well publicized, and I, I believe there's going to be a Gordon conference on that. Now, there's a critical problem with that idea, and that is for it to work over long distances, it means that an area at the back of the brain would have to project onto a part of the thalamus that projects to an area at the forefront of the brain. It doesn't. In fact, we, we have data on this. Adjacent areas, adjacent areas do have common territory which interconnect to both areas. And the notion of the, of the thalamic loop, it's called a cortical thalamocortical loop, is perfectly valid if you're talking about V1 to V2 or TO to TE or one adjacent area to the next adjacent area. It doesn't actually, uh, there's no evidence. And we were going to kind of try and uh, prove the, ex the possibility or non-possibility. But when we did just some very, very preliminary experiments, it seemed to us that there was very little evidence that you would have that kind of connectivity from the thalamus that would allow long-distance connections. Can I be the devil's advocate? That, that's perfectly reasonable, but you also, in the introduction, you also say that's not true for cortical connectivity. And so it's no more true for the cortex. That is, you said most cortical connectivity is very local. So the problem with getting from the back to the front is just as true for intracortical pathways as that's, that's, that's not actually exactly what I said. We have long-distance connections in the cortex, yeah. and they're very weak. Okay. They're very weak. So some people think you can discard it. I think that's a grave mistake. One of the efforts that we have made, which I don't think has been sufficiently recognized, is that these very weak connections are amazingly systematic. They're highly consistent across individuals. And I think that they're doing something. What they're not doing is transferring information in a dense fashion, like you do from the LGN to V1. They're not doing that, that's for sure. So that might be restricted. The band path is limited, and it might be restricted to areas within the same modality, for example, like V1 to V2 or, v, or V1 to, to V4. Well, V1 to V4 is not... V2 to V4, for example. But certainly not over the very long distance. But I think that the... I think that the weak connection, um, and I'll come back to that again. Thank you for that. But yeah. Henry, uh, Helen Barbas reported these projections from frontal areas in the cortex to the thalamus that then throw out collaterals that terminate in primary sensory area. So that might suggest that maybe you, you don't go, let's say, in a forward fashion over the thalamus into the cortex, but in a top-down fashion you might, or you don't buy that data. Uh, These are tracer injections in, in cortex. Right? Yeah, no, I, I, well, I, I'm a great believer in feedback connections, so descending projections, projections coming from higher, going back to uh, lower areas, I think are intriguing. I think that's an important factor. But you don't find that in feed-forward connections. So if you're, going, if you're talking, and most people perhaps excessively are interested in feed-forward processing, so it's not happening at that level. So, um, so, yes, so I'm not going to address that, but I would just say one thing about that. There is, there is a structure which is absolutely intriguing, which has exactly the connectivity that Murray Sherman's been talking about, and it's called the, it's called the claustrum. The claustrum is actually, uh, you can think of it as a, it's a, you can think of it as a cortical structure, but it's sort of subcortical in the sense that it's in the white matter. The claustrum 
developmentally speaking, is the seventh or eighth or whatever layer of the insula. It's actually for, uh, embryonically related to the cortex. It's not, it's not thalamus in any way. But the claustrum has the strongest input to any cortical area coming from a subcortical, let me call it subcortical, structure. And we don't know what it's doing. The claustrum is a small structure. It, it projects to the whole of the cortex except the insula. Now, isn't that intriguing? It doesn't actually, and it, it's immediately below the insula. And the thing of proximity and connectivity is a very strong feature. So this absence of a connection, or virtual absence of a connection between the insula, actually that was uh, pure or less predicted that in a conversation we had with him a few, uh, a few months ago. It was interesting. So that's hot off the press. We haven't published it. So the, the claustrum is a very small structure. It has the largest input, largest non-cortical, let me call it, input. It's, it has a stronger input than the LGN to area V1. And it's a small structure, so this input is going to be highly broadcasting. It's going to be the same, the same cells are going to have to be projecting to many areas. We don't know what it's doing. Well, it, well I don't, anyway. There's a special issue being put together on the claustrum, and I don't think we'll be able to write up our results on that. But So the claustrum is an intriguing area. So coming back now, uh, the plan. I'm going to be talking about the topological versus spatial embedded networks in terms of connections between cortical areas. This will lead me to the conclusion that there's an importance in weight and distance relationships. And I'm going to be talking at great length, or reasonably great lengths, about the influence of changes in brain size on the spatial embedding. And then lastly, I'll, I'll say something about the structural and functional hierarchy. Um, if, if you're talking about connections, if you're talking about anatomy, um, at some point, somebody said, and either they're going to say it or they're going to think it. They're going to say, hey, but you know, we don't really care about anatomy, right? We want to know about the function. As though if some, you have some kind of version of something. You have a structural version, and then you have this functional version. And there's really no need to take the two into consideration. I, I think that um, there is. I think that there's a, a close marriage between structure and function. In the good old days, people studied the two. Now it's drifted apart, and you either do one or you do the other. But um, there is a necessity to see how structure does relate to function, because I think it's I think that's a very interesting way to understanding that. And I'll just talk very briefly about a collaboration we've had with Pascal Fries recently, where he's taken our data and looked how it fits with a function analysis of hierarchy in the mechanical cortex, and shows that it fits actually really rather well. That the structural hierarchy that I'll be talking about actually fits very well with a functional hierarchy. And that's interesting, because it means you can now go into the human cortex and try and understand functional hierarchy in the human cortex, where you can do the same sorts of recordings that Pascal has been doing. And, and I, think that that I think that this notion of hierarchy, this way of trying to grapple with how the local processing is integrated with the global processing, is going to be hugely enriching in, in terms of understanding cortical function. So um, this is what we're not doing. Mostly, when people are talking about connectivity in these, this day and age, they're talking, about, they're talking about this. This comes from diffusion MRI, whole brain imaging. It's a human brain. It's, it's very brightly colored, of course, which uh, is always a, a, a huge plus in terms of scientific uh, truth. The more color, the wider the color scheme, the more, the more meaningful something can become. And it, it has problems. And we are looking at some of these problems by, by trying to see how well this fits with what we're doing, which is track tracing, which goes back to the last century. It goes back to Kuypers and people who was a Dutch uh, anatomist and who developed these tracers. So you inject the tracer in a cortical area. You wait a certain amount of time. The tracer is retrogradedly or anteriorgradedly transported. You then process the brain, and you look where the labeled neurons are. And this tells you where the labeled neurons are. They project to the region that you injected. That's called track tracing. This is called tractography. Now, 
what we're interested in doing with David Van Essen and, and the group in Oxford is looking at how well the tractography maps on to the track tracing. So David refers to track tracing as a gold standard. David Van Essen talks about it as a gold standard, and, and in some sense, you, that, that, that's okay. You can do that. It, it turns out that over medium and long distances, the track tracing, uh, the tractography doesn't predict at all the results you get with the track tracing. So there's a lot of problems in terms of understanding long, medium to long distance connections. So that's a, that's a, 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 a state of reserve. But the, uh, perhaps m more importantly is the tractography doesn't give you any notion of direction. It tells you that A and B are connected, but you don't know if A projects to B and B projects back to A, or is the connection uni only going in one direction. There's a kind of myth around, which is that all connections in the cortex are uh, reciprocal. Totally not true. If you go back through the, the literature, it's known to be not true since you know, the work of Kuypers and many other people. It's a difficult thing to actually prove. Uh, it's actually, you've got, to be, you've got to go to great lengths. But you do find examples of connections in the cortex where it's reasonable to say that the connection is unilateral. In our hands, the, uh, there's, uh, there are unilateral connections. That's, that's true. And then the, on the other, further, the connections are very, very asymmetrical. So you can have a very strong connection from A to B and a rather weak connection from B to A. And as we're talking about strength of connection, as we're saying that the distance of the connection and the strength of the connection is the defining feature of the network, being able to decide the direction of the connection is actually very important. So there's a problem with the correlation between tractography and track tracing. There's a problem with the directionality. But lastly, there's a problem in the sense that you don't know where the cells of origin are. So when I get round to talking about hierarchical processing or hierarchical structure, that's all to do with understanding the laminar origins of the cortical projection and the laminar target of the cortical projection. And you don't get at the moment, that, that could happen, but at the moment, today, tractography can't give you data on that. And I think that that's going to be uh, something which in the, in, the, in the future is going to be explored more and more. And I'll just say a few seconds, uh, right at the end of my talk, I'll say something about that. So um, I'm sort of notorious in not getting to the end of my talks. And then if I don't get to the end of the talk, uh, I don't get round to giving the credit. And if you don't give the credit, it, it looks like I have this huge head, you know, this, uh, like, but, a mouse like a mouse brain. <laughs> uh, and that, that's actually not what I want to do. This, this work I'm going to be talking about is a very much a collective effort. I wouldn't be able to answer all of the questions that you could imagine you can throw at me because it's, there's different expertise from different people. Uh, this, and not everybody's here. Um, so this is Kenneth Knobloch, who um, is very analytical in his way of thinking about things and, and, and has done a lot of the statistics which made it possible for us to see the relationships I'll be talking about. Colette de Hay has been a long collaborator and worked on many aspects of this work, particularly at the early stages. Nicholas Markov was the student stroke postdoc uh, who was involved with a huge amount. He was with us for, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years and um, was, a, was, a, was a giant in, in uh, pushing a lot of the ideas here ahead. Zoltan Sarasai is a physicist at the uh, laboratory of Notre Dame, which is in America. And he's a specialist in graph theory. So a lot of the graph theory techniques, which I'll be talking about, were, were fought out by him. This is um, Maria Erske Ravaz, who was his student, who's now back in Romania. They're both Romanian. Everybody in Romania does graph theory, right? <laughs> I don't know. They have these bridges, and they try to work out how you get from one place to another across these bridges. And they work out all these funny maps and things. But um, so these two people were, were really key in, in, in a lot of this. Uh, David Van Essen has been um, 
vastly important. He's developed all sorts of uh, bench, bench tools to look at, visualize uh, connectivity and, and what have you. And, and actually, quite frankly, he was the only other senior uh, anatomist on, on, on this particular team. So that's been, he's been a, an important role. I'm not really going to be talking very much about this, but I think if I had more time, it would be. This is Pascal Fries, and that is with Pascal Fries. I mentioned it, and, and this joint student, I mean, he's not a joint student. He was with me, now he's with Pascal. And we, it's with Pascal Fries that we've been looking at this relationship between the functional hierarchy and the structural hierarchy. And actually, it's refreshing to meet a physiologist who cares about structure. And Pascal does. He pays a lot of attention to structure. And so that's been an interesting thing. And this is Chao Jing Wang. And uh, we've been modeling some of this uh, with Chao Jing, but I, I don't think I'll have time to, to go into that today. Uh, so um, what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you that the probability of connections between different cortical areas is actually much higher than we believed for a long time. Uh, it turns out that the, the density, the total number of connections which could exist, which do exist between cortical areas, is about 70%. About 70% of all connections that can exist, exist. That means that most cortical areas are connected to most other cortical areas, period. So back in the days when traces were very inefficient, Somebody came along and said, oh, you know what? LIP is connected to PIP. And people said, oh, wow, that's really interesting, because that tells me something about what's happening. But when you know that LIP is connected to virtually all the other visual areas, and so is PIP, if somebody comes along and says they're connected, you're going to say, well, yeah, you know, big deal. So what? It doesn't tell you very much. So this is actually, uh, surprisingly, a recent finding. It shouldn't be. It is. There's a sociological issue here. I'm going to go through it because I think you have to be aware that there are sociological problems in science. There are reasons why people choose to ignore certain things. But we could have known this for a number of years. Now, why is that important? Other than simply no longer caring about PIP and LIP being connected, well, it tells you that you want to know how strongly LIP and PIP are connected. Are the connections between LIP and PIP very strong? Are they stronger than between LIP and NT, for example? So it, it puts the searchlight back onto the notion of the strength of the connectivity. But it also has an impact, and Tony's heard me say this before, and his team have uh, actually developed the analysis that I'll be showing you, but it's had an impact on the principle of connectivity, what you think the mode of connectivity is, that defines what is the cortical network. So until a few years ago, the dominant thinking, until a few years ago, until now, the dominant thinking is that you have small world networks, that the small world network summarizes, explains, predicts, tells you what is the principle of cortical-cortical connectivity in terms of cortical areas. The small world network is a social network, it comes from the social sciences, where people are interested in society, in understanding how, how well rumors or information can flow through society. And to do this, you want to know what is the connectivity between human beings on the planet. And so the small world network was that um, actually the, the five or six hops from any person to go from any one person to any other person on the planet needs five to six hops. So your six handshakes from the Queen of England. That's reassuring, isn't it? But if you want to understand how viruses propagate or how AIDS propagates or what have you, how information propagates, that's vastly informative because it tells you things go very, very quickly. Now, the density of the human race in terms of connectivity let's not take radio broadcasting into consideration, is amazingly low. So the fact that your six handshakes from the Queen and maybe 10 or 11 from Hitler is actually surprising, isn't it? You don't expect that. And neurobiologists found that intriguing because integration with economy is what we believe the brain is doing. 
This is how you get information flowing around the brain, is by having a high degree of economy and a high degree of integration. So this had uh, an intriguing impact. Now, what I'm going to be telling you is that if you have a high-density graph, it doesn't mean anything to say that it's a small world. That's what I'm going to be telling you. And I'm going to be showing you that the fact that the graph is highly dense has been known since people have began to compare databases. But because the sexiness of the small world led to people having um, a slightly different viewpoint. So um, what I'm going to be doing, which is a little bit sort of in the danger zone here, is I'm going to be making this comparison in my talk between the macaque and the mouse. This is a database that we put together uh, and was published with Markov et al. in Cerebral Cortex in 2014. And it's uh, color coded, so the strength of connections are here. So there's 70% of these squares are actually connected. There's a, it's showing you strength of connection, so it's a little bit difficult to sort out, but that's what it's showing you, about 67%. This is a mouse connectome taken from collapsing uh, the Allen Brain Institute uh, database, which was published in Nature in 2014, and Zing et al., who published a database in the same year in Cell, and when you put those two databases together, they're using the same parcellation, so that it's legal, you can do that, you end up with a database which is 67%, exactly the same. I don't think that's hugely significant. Don't, I think there's a few errors. I think this is all a bit more connected than they think. But they don't completely. They don't completely. But I think they both suffer from false negatives. I don't think they have false positives. They, it's superb work. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's superb work. But I think the sampling was a bit low, and I think they missed a few connections. They were weak. They, maybe they didn't think they were too important, but they were there. So there's false negatives in both sides. You put the two together, you get 67%. I think either alone is about 50 or 55 or something like that. It doesn't have a huge effect. Are you, are you thresholding or are you saying any threshold? No, we're not thresholding. Not necessarily. Uh, it, it turns out that um, most of the weak connections we're talking about go down to not one connection. Maybe it's uh, maybe it'll be sort of like five or six neurons which have actually been observed. But don't forget, we only look at sort of less than half a percent of the total tissue. So if you see six neurons, that means you, if you were to look at the totality of the of the tissue, you'd expect to see three or four hundred. So it's not necessarily one connection. No, no, it's not. No, this is a database that we put together by injecting all of these areas, and I'm going to be talking about COCOMAC in very polite terms in a few minutes. So if you take, if you take the graph density, it's 67%. This is now in the macaque. This is the Markov uh, database. It's 67%. If you remove connections randomly from that, the... Um, Average path length goes from a little bit under one and a half up to when you've removed down to about 10%, you come to path length of about three. This is a, a certain range of probability, and here the graph begins to break up. Break up meaning you begin to get unreachability. Now here are the, here are the, the uh, databases. So this is Thelman and Van Essen in 1991, which is here. Sorry, Dave Feldman and Van Essen, which is here, which is about 35%. And the COCOMAC that you mentioned is largely based on an updating, a, a, a very systematic updating of, the, of uh, Van Essen's database back from 1991. And um, this is, uh, in 1991, Feldman and Van Essen reported a density of about 35%. But they, they said that if you uh, predicted, if you looked at the connections which had not been tested, Feldman and Van Essen didn't actually do any track tracing in that study. What they did is they took all the available publications, there are something like 300, 
and collapse them to make a, 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 a consistent database. Well, no, not a consistent, a database. That's what they did. It's a collated database. So in that collated database, they had connections that hadn't been tested. And they said, well, if you were to test those connections that hasn't been tested, you would probably have a, a density of around about 45%. That's what they predicted. They said, look, we've taken all the connections reported in the literature. It gives us a square matrix. These are, these are, this is the total reported density. It's a difficult exercise to do because anatomists don't necessarily use the same terminology. They don't have the same plane of section. They're not using the same sorts of tracers. You don't know always exactly where they've injected. This was a huge amount of work. It's a mammoth study, and it's given birth to the COCOMAC. It is the grandparent of the COCOMAC. I can come back to that in a minute. So Feldman and Van Essen reported 35% predicted that if you, were to look in, if you were to look at untested examples, you would get 45%. And that's what, they actually, that's what they actually published. Now, it's a huge article. Not everybody read to the end. Important. Read to the end. Now, in 1998, a French group uh, of uh, Michel Ambert, uh, headed by Jouve, who was a mathematician who was interested in graph theory, updated Feldman and, and Van Essen in 1998. They looked through the literature. They looked at the publications, which had come out since 1991. And they said the de density is now about 40%. Jouve used a graph theoretic model to infer the probable connectivity of the untested connections. Okay, So they had a, a, a reasoned fashion of doing it. Feldman and Van Essen, what they did is they made a guess, and sort of an intelligent guess. A back, no, it wasn't even the back of an envelope. It was a kind of probability thing. Jouve made this much more uh, analytical prediction, and they predicted something in the region 58%. So the density we're reporting back now, given the new connections which we can find in the literature, is not surprising. That's the point I'm trying to make. 67% is not in any way surprising. You would imagine it would be at least that. Now, that's, I've explained to you now all of these databases here. And they actually, they, if you take the average path length, you work out the path length that they have, they all fall on this point here. So there's a, there's a systematic relationship between these databases. These colored zones here, when you remove connections, this is the point that our, data, our graph begins to break up. That means you begin to get unreachability beginning around about here. This is the interval. This is the, 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 the interval of variability according to which connections you actually remove. And this is the breakup of the Juvetal. And this is the breakup of David's. So David Van Essen's database, you had to remove quite a few connections before things became unreachable. Now, from these studies here, uh, this one here and this one here are studies which have put forward as a strong theme in the publication the notion of a small world. This, the idea that the, the cortical cortical network between cortical areas is a small world network. That, that is to say that it's uh, enabling you to go from any area to any other area with a small number of hops. So the first one is a paper by Honey et al. This is Spawns is the last door for it. It's published in PNS. They took David Van Essen's database. They took actually an updated version of that, which had gone into CocoMac. And um, they removed connections. And they assumed that untested connections would not exist. That's a huge assumption. Uh, Malcolm Young did essentially the same in 1993. Modda and Singe in 2010, this is a PNS paper, did exactly that, but they introduced a completely different nomenclature for what you're calling a cortical area. And so, um, actually, when I read their paper, I don't know what areas they're talking about. I mean, some of them I do, but some of them I don't. So when you remove connections, 
you can remove one connection. In fact, uh, with one connection removed from honey, you've already got unreachability. That means there's just one connection, which is making everything connected to everything. Uh, the same thing with, Felmet, with Malcolm Young's study in 93. Modder and Singe has 13 unreachable areas in it. Okay, so I have, an, I have, a, I have a network, okay. and I've told you that uh, one and a half hops, I can go from en one area to any other area. Now, uh, how many can if I remove a few connections from that randomly, um, at some point I will begin to have areas that I can't get to, that don't have any connections. These uh, databases here, you have to remove a huge number of connections before that begins to happen. This database here, right from the beginning, without removing any connections, has areas that are not connected to anything. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a network. It's not a network. There's a problem. Uh, these studies have all made this claim that you have, um, that you have a small world network. This is, this is the claim. Now, um, there's one way of, of testing uh, what we mean by a small world network. Watson Strogatz uh, developed this, this notion. So if you go from a regular lattice where every connection is every area or every structure, every node is connected to an adjacent node, and you do a random rewiring, the path length drops very rapidly, but the clustering remains very high. When you get to a point like this, and you go continue the rewiring, you get a random network, and when you get the fully random network, the clustering plummets, and the path length doesn't change very much. In this region here, you have a small world network, and this is the uh, approach that uh, Tony's group developed as a way of, of uh, looking at this further in, with the density. So there's a simple test that you can do. You can rewire a network. If you have a change in the clustering index, then you can say this is a small world. A clustering index is the friends of friends effect. The fact that the social network has this very small number of hops to go from any individual to any other is that most of your friends know each other. And, and so if you lose that clustering, if you re-random the connections and you lose that clustering, you lose the short path length. You go into a random network if you get, to a, if you get completely rewired. Now, if you look at the effect of density, this, uh, sorry, This is uh, looking at the uh, density at, at 6%. So 6%, this is, looking at, this is looking at rewiring in very dense networks. As you do this rewiring, the distance between the, the effect of the, of the rewiring becomes less and less in terms of the, of the path length and eventually disappears completely. And so it's this effect on density, which is as the density increases, the influence of the rewiring disappears, and you virtually don't have any effect of the rewiring. So if I take this room, you've all been together now for uh, two weeks, 10 days. You've been interacting. You've been having drinks together and working together and talking over coffee and what have you. So the density of this group as a, as a graph would probably be around about maybe 100%. Maybe everybody knows everybody here. So if I said this is a small world network, it wouldn't have any meaning because you all are connected. That's all it means. This is the only objection we're making. Now, the small world network is a topological network because a lot of people, when they look at this, Strogatz and Watts, imagine that this rewiring process is somehow related to some sort of spatial notion. It isn't. The rewiring is not related to that. The small world network is not embedded. It's not spatially defined. There's no distance value here. And there's actually, in, this, in, the, in the real version, it's a purely binary network. It's no strength of connection. So it's not coming into it. So um, I'm going to be arguing against the small world network. And we're going to now look at the strength of connections. So what we're doing um, 
I'm trying to think if I should answer your question. Maybe I should say a word about Tony's question. What is the cortical area? Actually, strangely enough, there's very little attempt. There's very few reviews. If you go into Google and tap cortical area and look for a decent review, there's a rather nice book by Schultz uh, where Zeki has ri written a sort of preface to that. It's rather nice. And we've referenced it certain, a certain number of times. But there's no simple consensus about what a cortical area is. So if you talk about area V1, of course, there everybody's very happy because you can take your slide and you can see the aerial limit to it. You can see the cytoarchitecture with the, with the naked eye. And it has a very homogeneous function. You can map out visual space onto the onto the primary visual area, and it's all very, very straightforward. And you get to the limit of area V1, and there's a reversal of visual space across the vertical meridian, and you've got another cytoarchitecture, you've got another connectivity, and you've got another representation of space. So you're pretty happy about that. But as you get further and further afield, you go away from the, from the sensory areas, the motor areas, the, and, and you go into the cognitive areas, you go into prefrontal cortex, that gets all much more difficult. So then the question is, how many cortical areas do you have? What do you mean exactly by a cortical area? Felma, uh, Van Essen has, has uh, speculated about this. I think Broadman areas, I think there's about 20 or 30. There's not many in Broadman's areas, the original Broadman's areas. These are cytoarchitecturally defined areas where you look down the microscope and you say, this is different from that. There's my limit. What's interesting about that, and very few people have actually talked about it, is when you do that, you don't see, except for area V1 and even there, you don't see a strict limit. You get transition zones. Some people who want to criticize the notion of area imagine that this debunks the notion. Actually, it doesn't. That's terribly interesting. You have transition zones between areas, and very people, few people want to recognize that. So you go from one area, you go from one cytoarchitectonic reality to another through a zone where you have a kind of mixture of the two. And I think that's very, very interesting. And it, for me, it doesn't take away at all. To answer your question, uh, Van Essen repeatedly comes back to about 140 areas in the macaque and maybe 200 in, 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 the, uh, in the human. Now, if we were to increase the number of areas from uh, the atlas we've been using is 91, so undoubtedly, there are areas that we, we are subdividing. The insula, for example, there's six or seven subdivisions, and we've only got two or three. So as you subdivide the cortex and you get more and more areas, if you think about it, the, the, the number of areas is going to increase, and the density of connectivity that I've been telling you about, the percentage of possible connections of the total number that can exist, will go down. It will go down from 67 to something in the region of 40, 50. Um, I'm not particularly concerned about that. I, I don't think that says, oh, come on, we've got to go back and pull back in the, the small world. If you go down to the level of the column, and I think there's lots of reasons why you might want to do that, you, and you can with tractography, with, with whole brain imaging. You can take voxels and say, I want to think about the connectivity or the functionality of much smaller units. You will get down to low densities, and there you might well have the characteristics which are typical of a small world. I'm not worried about that either. And all I'm saying is that the small world doesn't apply to the atlas that you would probably want to have, which is going to be between 100 and 140 areas. It doesn't apply there for a very simple reason, which is one of density, the number of connections. Some of those connections are <coughs> extremely weak. What do weak connections? We can come back to that in the discussion because I think it's an interesting idea about what, connection, what weak connections actually do. And Henry, on the issue of area, so even though it's not fully clear, if we would lock you up later in the afternoon and say we will only release you once you've given us a list of the areas of the neocortex, what are the criteria you would use to then make that assessment? Like you, you talk about the connectivity, uh, density might be a criterion, cytoarchitectonics, Salamic innovation, I guess. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria which you use to then define these areas? Functional these criteria. Huh? Fu you would have functionality. You'd have the function. You'd have the localization of function. So you do lesion studies at a Mashru Rushworth, and you would see that, you know, what is the region that you have to remove to lose some kind of type of uh, 
uh, cognitive function in the prefrontal areas. It, it's largely in the prefrontal areas that it becomes very difficult. So there's, there are other ways. The point, the, the point I wanted to make, there are other ways of splitting up the cortex. It will have effect on density. And it, eventually, if you come down to smaller and smaller units, you come down to the column or the single neuron, you're going to have a very, very sparse graph, and it might well be uh, a small world. And there's ways of testing that. You could use viruses of what, various kinds, and you, and you would be able to prove it. But the, the, the point I'm going to be making is that if you, if you take on board this notion of strength of connection and the distance, it turns out to be very profitable because it makes predictions. The small world network does, is not in the business of making predictions. Now, models that don't make predictions maybe are not that, not that interesting. The, but the uh, weighted graph that I'm going to be talking about makes a lot of predictions. And I'm not going to be going through very many of them, but just some of them. Can I just ask you very quickly about um, uh, so Charles Evans has, has done uh, obviously a lot of work on, on the issue of what is a brain area and yes. the type of response. Um, so um, he's used additional criteria to his extended promotion of psychological experiments. And he now talks about reception of brain areas yep. and so on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, no, I think that's, uh, I think that's hugely interesting. And and looking at the, um, looking not just looking at the receptors, but looking at the gene expression. I think that uh, there's a big uh, effort in, in that direction, and looking at the combinations of genes and how they change across areas. And I'll come back to that very much at the end of my talk. So. Um, so now we're going to talk about the weight of connections. And what I'm going to tell you is that the strength of connections shows very, very strong regularities. In a nutshell, if you have to leave now, you need a nutshell so you can say you can remember what's, uh, what's important here. In a nutshell, short distance connections are very strong. Long distance connections are progressively weaker. That's it. That is it. That's the nutshell. Now, it turns out that the way that the strength of the connection decreases over distance is, is very systematic. And, it's, and it, that systematicness is what I want to look at now. So this is now looking at the, all of the connections into area V2, all of the connections into area 10. Area 10 is, a rostral, is on the rostral pole. It's the most anterior part of the of the cortex. So it's right at the front of the prefrontal cortex. Area V2 is a visual area. It's a secondary visual area. It comes after area V1. So it's in the occipital part of the cortex. And this is ranking the areas with the strongest connection to the weakest connection. And this is doing exactly the same thing for area 10, going from the strongest down to the weakest. And this is looking at the strength of the connection. And this is a log scale. So this is showing you that the strength of connection, which is defined as the number of, we can go into it, but believe me, um, it's the strength of connection is defined as the strength of the number of connections projecting across between the two areas. It goes across a log scale. There's five orders of magnitude in the range. So that's a very, very large range. So the weakest connection is very weak compared to the strongest connection. If I was talking about the LGN going into V1, this is not V1, but if I was, it would be around about here, and the claustrum would be about here. You know, I was telling you about the claustrum being a very strong connection. It really is for a subcortical projection. And of course, we've known this for a long time. The LGN is, is actually relatively weak in terms of its input. The thalamus is relatively weak. But this distribution here is, um, this distribution here is, uh, is a log normal distribution. And I'll be coming back to that because we find that signature, we find that signature again and again. This is now looking at the, uh, the features taking all 29 injections. So these injections are reasonably well scattered across the cortex. So it, get, it constitutes a subgraph. A subgraph, we believe, reflects the features of the full graph. The, if we had all areas, we've only looked at 29, but we believe that if we looked at all 91, we're working in an atlas of 91, we believe that the subgraph uh, faithfully reflects the statistical properties of the full graph. So the, um, 
This is looking at the distances. The distances, all of the distances here, have a normal distribution. This is looking at the strength of connection, which is binned. And we find it has this space constant. That is wrong. I don't know why I've got that. It's 0.18. So uh, the space constant is very, is very systematic, and this is an exponential decrease in, in connections. And these are the uh, distances of the connections. So this is the, sorry, this is the log normal distribution of the weights. This is a log scale showing you the distribution of weights so that the, you have very few very strong and very few very weak. This is the distribution of distances, and um, Zoltan Torakai and his, his uh, student suggested that we should look at the, uh, the properties of the network by building, by building random networks based on this exponential decline of connections as a probability function. And then use these random networks to compare and see how well or how closely or differently they looked with respect to the network that we were looking at. And this is what I'm going to pass on to now. Oh, sorry. This is, so you can see this is all kind of not really very well rehearsed. This is looking at the same thing now in the mouse. So in the mouse, this is now with a normalized distance. We get a decline which is, which is appreciably similar. This is now looking at the distribution of, of, uh, of uh, distances. And we're finding that the distances in the macaque are much more pointed. This is looking at another property, which is the similarity. And it, it's showing that there's a, there's a relationship between macaque and mouse. Now, to, to compare two networks, Alain published a, in, in Science a, a, a recipe for doing that. And he was arguing that if you, look at, if you look at subgraphs within a network, and if you look at the frequency of certain motifs, that that will be a key to understanding the global properties of the network. Now, I'm not going to be following that up in any kind of detail, but we will be using this motif distribution as a way of looking at uh, the network in the, in the macaque and then looking at it in the mouse. These are the motifs that you can describe. So you have, you have 16 different motifs. So they're all, these are motifs of size 3. These are all combinations of free areas that you can get. Motive number 13 is, uh, is all those sets of free areas where you get bidirectional connections between A, B, and C. Uh, motive number 0, for example, is those <coughs> sets of free areas where there's no connection at all. Okay, so what, what, what Alain has been des describing is that if you look at different sorts of <coughs> if you look at different sorts of networks power grids or metabolic networks or gene regulation networks, as you look at different sorts of networks, the frequency of these different motifs changes. And he's argued that looking at the way that those frequencies change is a key to understanding the properties of that network. I'm getting, I'm getting hoarse. <coughs> so when you do that for the data, this is now taking the macaque data. This is the motif with no connection between all three nodes. It's, it's actually rather low. These are the motifs for the fully, con this is a fully connected triangle. It's very high. And um, if you, you, I don't know if you can see this. I don't know why people sit at the back, actually. It's strange. Why, why do you do that? <laughs> you should come with binoculars, you know? Because then you, you could see if you have binoculars. But people in the front, uh, who are obviously avid for information, and those at the back who don't really want to get overloaded, won't be, will be, you, in the front you'll be able to see this. This is A going to B, B goes to C, and C goes to A. These are unidirectional connections. The brain hates that. Brains don't want that. I go to you, you go to him, and he comes to me. Yes. Most of the loot architecture that, that, that the networks have described is very subtle. The networks are basically triangular cell dynamics and so on. Yes. 
No, 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 no. Well, <laughs> what we're saying is, if you look at these uh, motifs, uh, the frequency of the motifs tells you something about the processing. This is looking at, we're looking at the cortex. Of course, we should take, we should include the subcortical structures. We should probably include the big toe. I mean, everything is connected to everything. The hand is connected to the wrist, the wrist to the arm, the arm to the shoulder, the shoulder to the neck, the neck to the head. It all comes together. But we're looking here just at cortical cortical networks. What are the properties of the cortical cortical networks? And now we're going to be looking at the strength and the, and the weight distance properties. Now, uh, for you people in the front row, you can see that this, this has got a very low frequency. And I think it's, I think it's sort of significant. I said earlier on that a lot of people think that all connections in the cortex are bilateral. That A goes to B and B goes back to A. It's not true. You have unidirectional connections, and, and here they are. These are all of the unidirectional connections that you can find. These fully connected triangles are very common in, in the cortex. So there's undoubtedly bidirectionality is a, is a strong feature, but it's not the only feature. That's the point I wanted to make. If I was using COCOMAC data, or some people's version of COCOMAC data, because it's not quite the same thing, and I had a strong kind of thing, you know, unidirectional connections don't exist, this motif would disappear, this motif would disappear, this motif would disappear, all those unidirectional motifs would disappear. They're there. And they're also actually there in COCOMAC if you treat COCOMAC with the respect it deserves. So, yes, this is not taking everything into account. We're looking just at cortical cortical networks. Yes? So the, the thing that is, seems to be, to me to be missing to make this more interpretable is the prediction of the combined motifs. Does the, the, the prediction of the three-way connectivity based on one-way connectivity? Because, because, for instance, if you see uh, motif number two, which is a one-way arrow, and then motif three, which is two one-way arrows, right? Since those are infrequent, then you would logically expect that the motif that you said doesn't exist, which is number eight, is in fact doesn't exist. So, y y so y you can't really, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't really say that eight exists less than would be expected from the existence of the probability of the submotifs. So uh, in other words, I think that the more complex combinations <coughs> have to have some predicted, some expected value based on the, to, to say that something really doesn't happen, you have to say it happens less than would be expected from based on the frequency of the components that make it up. Well, you, you can do that by making random models and seeing how yeah, different, exactly. how different that, that's what we're going to be doing. So then you look, you compare your random model, and you say, well, it's more or it's less, and therefore it's, it's, it's significantly more or significantly less. Okay, thank you. So um, you're, you're not going to be ruthless with time, or you are? No, come on. Henry, please. We have to learn things, no? Okay. So now this is looking, this is the black bars of the data. This is simply reporting to you what we find in the data. We have 29 injections. We take all, free com all combinations of free nodes, free areas, and we looked at the motives. This is now um, making, building random networks with the same number of nodes, with the same node distribution, but we're making a probability which is based on this exponential rule that I reported to you. And this uh, says that from this random network, if you predict this binary feature, the uh, random network shows a reasonable uh, fit with the data that you find. These, these fit actually reasonably well. If we look at the, um, if we now look at the uh, blue bars, the blue bars are doing these random networks, but not using a probability based on the strength of connection, but using a constant rule. And the fit decreases measurably. So this argument is saying if you, if you think about the motifs, whether you've got a free areas strongly interconnected, yes you have, if those connections are very strong and they will be very close by, if you want to put it back into sort of very sort of simple terms. So it's, it's not 
hugely surprising, but what it's showing you is that the um, exponential distance rule has a good, uh, has a good fit to but it. Henry, question now. I mean, you must be applying some other constraints, right? Because if I would just take uh, a set of nodes and I would use your uh, exponential decay rule to wire them up, you would just expect all motifs, certainly in the local area, to occur. These so you would, you, and since the majority of connections is in the local area, and you would generate all possible motifs, modulus the number of nodes that you're connecting together, would you, so would you expect a different kind of distribution? I mean, uh, are you imposing any other constraint in wiring up your random network? Are you only using the EDR? Yes, you're only using the EDR, and you're using the number of connections that you observe, so your total oh, okay. number of connections okay, that, that are available to you. So, um, all that's published. It's all published. So it's true, you're saying. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> but Henry, and I, what I usually do is present the published data. Okay. But if we now split it out towards, let's say, laminar distribution and cell types, I don't know if this is a reasonable question, but wouldn't the motifs then become, let's say, almost like meaningless? No, no, no. You could do that, and you could have... You, we have so three... These motifs, I'm saying. Yeah, you could have... Motifs which are defined by uh, just any, any free node, but you could have motifs which are defined by some other feature. You could also have four areas or five areas, and then the whole thing gets much more complicated. So you can define whatever it is that you're interested, the sort of nodes that you want to put into this particular mix. So everything is published up to here. This is all published. This is uh, put together in the last couple of days, and I didn't expect to talk about it, but then um, we sort of said over dinner that maybe we should present unpublished stuff, and this is looking at the mouse, and this what is what surprised me. This is not what I would have predicted. So remember, we, we talked about the mouse, and we talked about this, the, the changes in the scaling features in rodents versus primates. We talked about the importance of the smooth brain versus the folded brain. We talked about the total degree of connectivity changing as you go from a small brain to a big brain, this is now looking at exactly the same features that we looked at here. And at a first glance, you will agree, it looks rather similar. The motif distribution looks similar. Well, I'm surprised by that, but of course I shouldn't be, because if you believe Allon, that's exactly what he would say. You know, this is a connectome, right? It's a cortical connectome. You haven't taken into account the thalamus. You haven't taken into account the thumb or the what have you. So the Alon, the Alon would say, yes, that's exactly what you would expect. You would expect to get a, a strong regularity in terms of the motif distribution. And the EDR rule, so I went over it very quickly, but we've looked at the exponential decline of strength of connections in, in, in rodents, applied this to the Allen Brain Institute data, collapsed with the uh, Southern California, and we get the same kind of predictability. So... Um, There's something missing. Ah, okay. So now what we've done, this is making null, uh, a null model using the experimental data versus random graphs with the same degree sequence and seeing if the null model gives a similar distribution. And it does. This is now asking the question, what about instead of using random graphs for the, for the, for the null model, we use ED, graphs which are being made with the EDR model. And again, we get a very, very strong similarity between the MAC and the mouse. So it suggests that the EDR is actually what's driving the similarity, hugely driving the similarity. Now, here we, uh, we um, use as the experimental data versus the networks generated by the EDR. So looking to see if there's a is a residual of something which is not in the EDR, which is similar in the motive distribution between the two sets. And here it begins to break down. There's a strong similarity, but there are differences. We don't know... So what, globally what this is saying, it's saying that there is a big similarity in this motive distribution. On one side, you could say that fits with what Alan would have predicted. 
On the other side, you can say, well, it's surprising, be given what I've told you about how big and small brains move and, and what have you, and rodents and primates. Now we're showing you that a large part of this similarity comes back to this exponential distance rule, this weight versus distance relationship. A large part of it, but not all of it. There's something which is left out of that. There's some similarity between macaque and mouse, and remember, I'm surprised by this, because I would have told you macaque and mouse is going to be so different because of what I do in corticogenesis or what, what have you, and there's all sorts of things I could put up. There's some other similarity in the network which is independent of the EDR. And what I think that might be, and it's purely speculative, totally unpublished, what that could possibly be is what we, we were able to show in a study we published in PNS a few years, that if you look at the cortical areas in a particular region, they have a common signature in their connections over very long distances. So if you look at the occipital areas and you look at the prefrontal areas that project to them, it's the same, it, not exactly, but there's a large similarity in the prefrontal areas that project back to the occipital areas. And the same for the temporal to the parietal or the parietal to the prefrontal, etc. So it could be that these commonalities, these long distance signatures, the similarity, the fact that a group of areas in a region tend to have a similar set of long distance connections that could be driving, that could be the feature which is common across the macaque and mouse. It could be both doing that kind of thing. I don't know. But it's a speculation. Very low frequency. Yeah, so then you would expect that this would not really affect its distribution to the deaf ear. Very little. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I, I grant you that. Minute, it would be a minute. It's a small effect, and it's not. It's not total. There are. There are. The, you know. There are differences. This is a difference here. There's. There's no overlap. But they, and these error bars are, are huge. So it's just a, a very weak ten. But it, it suggests that there could be something else outside of the EDR, beyond the EDR, beyond the exponential. So um, I'm going to sort of speed up because um, we're all fading here. Um, if you have, uh, you, you have this network, it's very dense, okay? It's 67% dense, whether it's a mouse or a macaque. That would suggest a high degree of homogeneity. Now, for somebody like Zoltan Torica and his student, homogeneity in a network is like quiet death. It's very difficult to get a complex function out of a homogeneous network. And so they're interested in non-homogeneity. Now, one way of looking at homogeneity has been the rich club. The rich club, what is a rich club? The rich club is a group of powerful men who sit on the board of directors of different, different enterprises, different clubs across the city. And the rich club meet late at night in the lobby of expensive hotels and they always smoke cigars and they drink very fine liqueurs. And when the rich club makes a decision, that decision impacts on every single enterprise that they're all in because they're all in these different, these different boards. That's the origin of the notion of a rich club. In um, Olaf Spawns and his co-workers have worked on the rich club in cortical cortical connectivity as being uh, related to the hubs. So going back to the early work of Hagman and others, there's been this idea that you can think of the, of the cortex and the connectivity between cortical areas in terms of hubs. What is a hub? A hub in the, in the, uh, for the airplane travel is when you have to go through uh, you have to go through Frankfurt if you want to go from here to Newcastle. You can't go straight from Newcastle because Newcastle is not a hub, so you go to a hub. In the cortex, the idea is that you have areas which are much more strongly connected to all other areas than, uh, and they become the hubs. So when you have these different hubs in the cortex, the rich club is, is that set of hubs which are more strongly connected amongst themselves than statistically you would predict. That gives the, the hub an enriched role in terms of communication across the cortex. Now, uh, hubs are fine if you have a sparse network. 
So if you, if you fresh hold your, your, your data, you do that, uh, so you can get rid of all the weak connections and you'll end up with, with something much is much sparser, and then you can begin to hope to see hubs. But in a, dense, a network of 67%, the hub doesn't really have a great deal of meaning. So we can't look at hubs, and therefore we can't look at the probability of the hubs being more connected than they should be, which is what the rich club is, in a network which is 67%. So what uh, Zoltan Torikai suggested and worked out very nicely was to look at the click distribution. A click is a set of nodes which are fully interconnected. And it turns out that when you look at the, um, when you look at the, the database that we have, you find, uh, you find 13 different clicks of size 10. The probability of finding that randomly in a network of that size is vanishingly small. So it's a very unexpected finding. I haven't got time, but if you look at the networks that we build with the exponential distance rule, you get the same frequency of clicks. So we believe that this click distribution is highly related to this weight distance relationship that I've been talking to you about. So it gives a strong heterogeneity to the network. And the strong heterogeneity to the network is what we believe is important for the complex function. So this Why is... Why do you call that heterogeneity now? Because I could argue this is a weak, another a way to quantify a rich club, because now you have another set of nodes that are tightly interconnected among each other. So it's still the same concept. It, 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 you it, point to a different set of nodes. There's a heterogeneity because that set of nodes share that property of being part of a clique. If you had a sparse network, you could do a rich club analysis and you will find cubs according to which database you're using and you will find a rich club. We're using a database which doesn't allow us to do that. Now, I grant you that you can argue that the function could be exactly the same. I have no, I have no objection to that argument. That's not okay. the claim I'm making. What we're making here is that yes, there is a heterogeneity. And is the heterogeneity the same structural con component as with the rich club, you'd have to go through this very carefully and then you would come to a decision about that. Might, that might well be the case. Now, when we do this in the, um, in the mouse, there's also uh, a set of clicks and it's also improbable. Not as improbable as it was in the macaque, but improbable. And it's also uh, explored and, and predicted by the exponential distance rule. So that's reassuring. But there is a big difference. You have in here a primary area. You have a primary auditory area and you have a primary motor area. In the click analysis that we did in the macaque, there's no primary areas. It turns out when you look at, we were talking about this last night, when you look at the primary areas in the rodent, and you make a subgraph, it's about 80 to 90% connected. And we've known this since the tracing of people back in the, back in the 60s. So it turns out that the, the, the inter-primary inter area connectivity is very high in the mouse. But if the, I think I heard you say that the peaks are predicted by the exponential rule. Yes. But the exponential rule is not predicted by peaks necessarily, so why do we need the peak rule if it's already predicted? Which is much more general. The click isn't a rule, it's an observation. It's, it's an observation. Yeah. So, so you, we could say that the exponential rule is very broad and general and very elegant, and it predicts that there should be some tightly connected nodes, and yeah. there are. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. so, so the clicks don't deviate from that. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no. No, <coughs> that, that's, that's okay. So <coughs> the difference between the mouse and the macaque, so this is actually what I'm... This is um, a, a bit the subject of what I'm trying to get here. There is a difference. The difference concerns the members of the click. You have primary areas. But when you look globally in the mouse, that's not inconceivable because you get connections between primary areas. Primary auditory cortex projects to primary motor cortex, projects to primary somatosensory cortex, projects to primary visual cortex, known for a long time. That's not the case in macaque. 
That's, there are connections between auditory and, and visual cortex, but it concerns a specific part of the visual cortex. It's the very far periphery, and I think it's got a very restricted function. But if you have this distance rule of connections that you talked about very early, uh, that is uh, some, eight, I don't know, 80, 90% very low form stuff. So if that, if the same rule in absolute uh, coordinates applies to rodents, then you would expect primary ears to be more connected just because they're closer to each other physically, or not? Or oh, not. We'll come back to that. I, I, if I don't satisfy you on that point, uh, remind me, but I, I will come, come back to that. So, um, this is maybe a little bit difficult to understand. Have, look at it carefully. It's, it's worth trying to understand these two, these two graphs. I haven't gone through any graphs so far, so just, just look at these two. This is looking, in the monkey, at the probability of connectivity over distance. This is a short distance. Everything is connected. Black is connected. White is not connected. So over short distances, everything, all areas are connected. As you go further and further away, this connectivity goes from 100 down to 0%. That is the story of the monkey. It's a very simple story. If you look at the similarities, you define it in terms of the cosine similarity. It turns out that as you, if you take neighboring areas, their connectivity profiles are very similar. Okay? Adjacent areas have very similar connectivity profiles. As you go further and further afield, that similarity decreases. That's another characteristic. This is now looking at the mouse. Over short distance, it's nearly 100% connected, but not quite. There's not much in it. I'm not making an issue out of that. But look what happens over distance. Over distance, instead of going down to something like 0%, it goes down and it actually comes up a little bit. For reasons that I'm not going to go into, I believe there were false negatives in the two studies, and I think globally there's still a few missing connections. We're doing some work on this at the moment, and there's still some missing connections. It's going to be higher than 70%. The primary areas are connected, and they're not connected in the, in the monkeys. So there are more connections globally in mouse compared to macaque. This effect is paralleled by the similarity effect. The similarity as you go from short distances to long distances shows a sharp, sharp, shows a decrease, and that decrease is less in the mouse compared to the macaque. Put those two things together, which is what um, this, these two things are doing here, macaque versus mouse. This is looking at simil similarity versus these distances, probability of connections. I'm not going to go through this because I don't perfectly understand it. Uh, Kenneth Knobloch put it together last week, and I'll get... I'll, get, I'll, I'll come unstuck trying to compare, compare that. But what you can think about it is the functional layout. This whole notion that strongly connected areas are over short distance and weakly connected areas over long distances, any physiologist could have told you that a long time ago. We know that. You have a constellation of visual areas, you have a constellation of auditory areas, a constellation of motor areas, and they're all interconnected, and they're strongly interconnected. And those connections get weaker as you go further away. What I think this is telling you is that functional layout is much less strict in the mouse compared to the macaque. So the motus distribution, everything we could throw at that, showed you something really rather similar. I haven't got time, but in the paper that we published a few years back, we showed that the exponential distance rule predicts very well the economy of wiring, the wire minimization that you get in the macaque. It showed you uh, the um, conduction efficiency and the global and, lo and local conduction efficiencies. And it showed very well the motor distribution, including unidirectional and bidirectional connections. We don't have the weighted data in, in, the, in the mouse at the moment, but the binary features, everything we look at it, it looks actually really rather similar, except this property here. Now, is that property an adaptive feature in the mouse? I think it probably would be. Or if you want to put it the other way around, what is the mouse lacking in, in terms of the bigger brain? The bigger brain seems to be able to be, but, and I think Ringo perfectly predicted this back in 1991, 
As the brain gets bigger, you get more specialization. As you get more specialization, you get a structurally functional layout which is much stricter. And that's what you have in, 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 the, in the mechanic. But, uh, Henry, they did Ringo not predict that you would get, uh, you would have to reduce the number of connections because uh, as the brain gets bigger, you've got more peripheral areas. You can't continue to connect to everything to everything else. Absolutely. At the same rate. But, you, but you're saying that in mouse, it's maybe 70% plus, but in the cat, it's still 67%. No. So you, you'd expect, according to Ringo, Absolutely. This was part of my introduction. I said that uh, uh, it's been known for a long time, it's been predicted for a long time and confirmed experimentally very recently that as the brain gets bigger, as the brain gets bigger, the number of connections actually decreases. This has been a prediction and it's been confirmed recently by Herculano Husserl has been able to measure precisely the amount of wire that you get versus the amount of numbers of neurons and shown that the, number, the amount of wire decreases as the brain gets bigger, and this is a big effect. It's not a small effect. So that's perfectly in line. What, what we're interested in here is looking at the, at the mouse and the macaque and to ask ourselves, uh, for example, um, as the brain gets bigger, is it the number of connections, the number of areas over long distances which decrease? And I can't give you the answer now. I haven't got the analysis completed. Or is it the strength of those connections? And it seems to be actually, my, my hunch is it's going to be actually both. So that brings me to this. As the brain gets bigger, the number, uh, the strength of your connections is going to decrease. I think we have evidence coming to that. And this comes from another study done in the social sciences, which is referred to the strength of weak links. And this was done by a man called Granovetter. It had as many hits in the, in the 70s and 80s as a small world network, and Granovetta was convinced that it was the weak links in society that give social cohesion. And so he was arguing that it's the weak links that you have to look at. Do you have strong links as the person you're, you're married to or getting divorced from or your son or something? That's your strong links. But it's the man, you, he says, you meet in the train who you talk to and he tells you something and this leads you on to find a new job or, or what have you. And it's so it's a multitude of the millions of weak links which is building the sort of global cohesion. And so coming back to the weak link, we know that weak links can have a profound effect on oscillatory coherence. And that could be enormously conditioning the transfer of information, not along a bandwidth, but in the way that the areas oscillate is going to be influencing the communication between them. So I'm going to sort of, uh, before I sort of faint here, um, that there was a question that you brought up about, the, um, about these primary areas, uh, the primary areas, and, and as the brain gets bigger, the primary areas, of course, get diluted. And this is something which is, this is uh, taken from Buchner, but he took it from Leah Krubitzer, who was here last year, who took it from... from and I think, last week as well. And last week. So Leah Krubitzer, I think, should be credited with this. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating... So this is your kind of your mammalian ancestor. We're all interested in our mammalian ancestor. This would be the mammalian ancestor. And as you got, go up some kind of imaginary thing, what you notice is, so it's color-coded. The primary areas are color-coded. Uh, vision is in blue, and motor is in red, green is in, in uh, uh, vision, auditory is in green. And as the brain gets bigger, the primary areas get more and more uh, distended, uh, more and more separated. And the uh, cortex, which is white, is association cortex, if you will. So as, a, as you go up the phylogenetic series, there is a multiplication of areas, there's an expansion of the cortical mantle, and you get a, additional associative cortex. This book, uh, the, the idea of Buchner was that you would have, and it goes back to Goldman Rakish, that the long distance associative areas would have more long distance connections. So we've looked at this in the mouse, and we've compared it with what we have in the monkey. This is looking at the macaque. This is the pr extended primary area, so it's looking at the constellation of primary areas in the visual, sensory, uh, uh, motor, what have you. This is looking at the associative cortex. This is the uh, um, non-dimensional non dimension, uh, size of the cortex, and you this is showing you the difference between the primary and the associative 
this is a macaque, and this is a difference in, in, in mouse. So their long distance connections are not longer in macaque versus mouse. They're as long. Uh, whether there's going to be something up here, whether this is going to turn out to be significant, I don't know. So, so far, I've been making this... Um, I've been telling you that you can predict all of these things. You can predict, uh, the, you can build these networks, and it tells you that you that it can explain the motor distribution, it can explain the wire minimization, it can give you the local and global efficiencies, and what have you. But what other kind of predictions might it make that we could actually come back to? Because I have made this argument that what's interesting about a model is its predictive capacity. What predictions could we make today? thinking about the exponential distance rule. Are there any? Well, I think there's two. I think there's one which is very far out, so see what you do with this. What I've been talking to you today about is making an injection in one cortical area and looking at the connectivity of all the cortical areas uh, in, in the cortex and how they project to it. This is, what we've been do this is what we've been talking about so far. Now you could ask yourself, what about the connectivity within a cortical area. Coming, now we're coming down to the single neuron level. There's a lot of interest in understanding that, that, that level. Well, we know that the strength of connections at that level are log normal. We know that. That's been shown again and again and again, and recently very eloquently by uh, Mersic Flogel and his collaborators. We know that there's a log normal distribution of weights. We know that there's a normal distribution of distances. We know that there's a big heterogeneity in strength of connections. So you're, there's a lot of features that you can find at the single neuron level. What we know from Marsic Flogel's work is that if you look at, if you do uh, calcium recordings and you look at the single neurons in the visual cortex, you find that the neurons which are, have similar receptive fields are strongly connected. And then you have all these weak connections and we don't quite know what those connections are doing. So I'm wondering if you were to go down to the single neuron level, if you were to channel down, you split up the cortex as you suggested, you go from an atlas of, of 91 to an atlas of 150, you go to 200, you come down to the individual vo voxel, you go down to the single neuron, you might find that you go on having this weight distance relationship. That a neuron in V2 is not going to have a whacking great strong connection to area 46 to a neuron in area 46. It's going to be doing exactly the same thing. That's a possibility. So the areas are essentially little boundaries that are, can be drawn onto this field for connectivity. Yes, and the transition zones I talked about, I think, are very important. And, and, and they're not, we, you, you said, what is an area? I don't think the problem of an area is because we don't have a sort of rigid limitation to any given area, which is sort of easily uh, discernible. I think the transition zone is a, is a functionally highly significant, highly significant region. Now, everything I've been telling you is, very simply put forward, is that the strength of a connection between a region and another region is related to how far away that region is. Okay? That's what I've been telling you. If you look at the two-dimensional map of the cortex, this is taken from Fellman and Van Essen. This is the map that they have. This is area V1, it's the primary visual area. This is area V2. Uh, this is the prefrontal areas. This is the frontal eye field uh, here, I think. This is the frontal eye field. This is, I talked earlier on about, this is the dorsal stream areas up here. And these are the ventral stream areas here. And I've drawn it out here. This is striate cortex, ventral stream, dorsal stream. You've all heard about dorsal and ventral streams, right? Now. If you look at V2 here, if you look at this cortical region of V2, and you look at this region of V2, what you notice is that those two parts of V2 are in very different neighborhoods. This is the foveal representation. It's in the neighborhood of the ventral stream. This is the peripheral representation. And V1 is just stuck on there. Don't worry about that. That's, that cut has been done just to make the two-dimensional map. So V1 and V2 representation of the periphery is very near the dorsal stream. The dorsal stream is involved with spatial relationships. The foveal representation of V1 and V2 is highly, is highly related spatially to the ventral stream. 
the foveal representation, the ventral stream. The ventral stream is involved with object recognition. So what you would predict from that is that foveal representation of V1 and V2 should be strongly interconnected with the ventral stream. The dorsal representation of V1 and V2 should be strongly connected with the... Sorry, I got that wrong. The, the foveal representation of V1 and V2 should be strongly interconnected with the ventral stream. The, fove, the periphery. far periphery should be strongly interconnected with the dorsal stream. We've done injections in those areas. We're going to publish it. This is unpublished. And it's, it's true. It's exactly what you would predict, and it's true. That means that the dorsal and ventral stream are to do with central and peripheral vision, which makes perfect sense. So the global, what I'm saying here is that I think you could channel down to the single neuron level, and I think there's arguments that might suggest, and I think the log normal distribution, the wide range of weights, suggests that at the single neuron level, you might have this spatial embedding. At the, mar at the larger scale, the, um, in the visual system at least, we have concrete evidence, which is being put together for publication, that the functional streams are dictated by the exponential distance rule, by this fact that the shape of the area means that different parts of an area come into different neighborhoods and therefore have different connectivity patterns. That means that the evolutionary search which has led to this mosaic to these different shapes is highly significant. The shapes of the areas is significant. So I've told you that this is a spatial embedding because the weight and distance of the connections themselves, but now I'm telling you that the actual shapes of the areas is what ensures that the visual system has these two different streams. So uh, all of these other shapes are to be explored in exactly the same sort of way. The question why that, connective, why that shape exists is to be explored. But the shape is not, I think, something which is, uh, which is uh, ambiguous or, or without any meaning. I think it's deeply embedded in this notion of spatial proximity. So um, I'm not going to go through uh, hierarchical processing. I'm not going to do that, but it, 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 it's all very interesting and, and you know, another, another time. But uh, what, I, what I would just like to end up with is... Um, is this, actually. If you look at this paper uh, from the Allen Brain Institute, if you look at this paper in the Allen Brain Institute, what, they, um, what, it, what it actually says is that, um, and you compare rodent with, with human, what it actually says is that the molecular specification or the molecular signatures of the infragranular layers in the rodent, you can find those signatures in the primate in the supergranular layers. Now, we know that during evolution, there's an expansion of the supergranular layers. My work with Colette de Haye is enormously axed on trying to understand that expansion. What makes primates radically different from, from rodents is this expanded supergranular layer and the compartmentalization that you can see in the supergranular layers. The fact that you have gene signatures in the supergranular layers that you find in the infragranular layers in the rodent suggests that the cortical cortical pathways that you can find in the primates are going to have unique properties. So what I was looking for, the unique property that we didn't find in the, uh, in the macaque versus mouse in terms of the motifs, I think is going to be found at the single cell level in terms of the gene expression. And so if we'd looked at this, if we'd had time and looked at this hierarchical processing, what it would be telling you is that by looking at the laminar origins of projections of the parent neurons of pathways, you can understand how the inter-aerial connectivity plugs into this local connectivity, which is the machinery which drives the cortex, actually. That's where the machinery is. That's where the business is. That's where the, the, the heavy weight of the connectivity is. And by looking at the gene expression of the pathways, you will get a much better understanding of what it is that makes those pathways specifically and uniquely different. So I'd like to stop there. But I would like also to take the prerogative of being a speaker to come back to something that we were discussing last night. Uh, I think this, it, the, in the uh, community of neuroscience, we're all looking for patterns. 
And in a sense, this is what I've been telling you about. I've said, you know, uh, small world networks is no good. Follow me into the exponential distance rule. This is a pattern, and you can lay it out, and, and things fit into this. And I've shown you all the evidence that that might be true in the macaque and the mouse and what have you. I think that the building up of this across the whole of the domain gives an illusion that we have a real understanding of the processing. And this illusion leads people to think of the biological system as a machine. Now, for me, a machine is a system that I can open up and I can see cogwheels and I can sort of more or less work out what wheel is driving what wheel and what is the interrelationship. And the mechanism has a finality which I can perfectly understand and perfectly predict. I think that the way we do science, it gives the, I think, illusion that we have exactly that kind of transparency in the biology. I don't think we have that for a moment. What I've been telling you is true. I don't, I'm not saying it's not true, but it's, it, there's, I'm not telling you about all the exceptions. I'm not telling you, you could go back and look at these pathways. What about the surprisingly strong pathway from the frontal eye field back onto V4? Isn't that interesting? And it's an exception. And it is. It is an exception. And that means something. The exceptions mean something. And there's so many exceptions that if you focus on the exceptions, you won't see the overall pattern. I remember listening to Hubel talking about uh, his work in the in the cortical columns when he, after he received the Nobel Prize. So he was standing here, and his friend at the time, which was called Margaret Livingstone, was standing next to him, and he was reading out his, his notes when he was doing these long penetrations in the macaque monkey, and he was recording the orientation selectivity. So the orientation selectivity changes in a regular fashion as you go perpendicular across <coughs> the cortex. Periodically, the cortex went fortitiously quiet, and he put unresponsive cortex, and it turns out that whenever he hit these unresponsive cortex, they were able to show him and Margaret, after he got the Nobel Prize, that that was when he was going through these patches of cells in the upper layers which are not orientated. So he shifted those out, not because he was being a charlatan, but simply because it didn't fit with the picture that he had. If he had put them in, he argued, he wouldn't have seen the orientation selectivity. So I think, that the, I think that there's a, I believe, I think it's a mistake to think of the biological system as a machine because that would suggest that the mechanism has that kind of regularity, and I don't think it is. What I was arguing last night is that the proof is in the eating of the pudding. When you get sick and you go and see the doctor and you say, look, you know, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, the first thing he tells you is that medicine is not a science. Every time. How many people have been to the doctor and had that? Well, you've never had a serious illness. They tell you that. That's what they tell you. It's not a science, and it isn't. It's a very complex, it's a very complex system of interrelating cogs and wheels and what have you. And what we're looking at, what we choose to look at, what we have to look at is the regularities. And the regularities do add up to something, but it's the exceptions from those regularities which are going to lead to the next series of regularities that we're going to be interested in. So, thank you for your patience and allowing me to <laughs> have the prerogative. That's great. Thank you, Henry. Uh, it's question time. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the prediction that you mentioned about uh, similar areas having kind of similar weak links over like a great distance. Doesn't it come from this weight versus distance uh, thing? Thank you. Yes, it does. And um, it, yes, the, the long distance connections being vanishingly weak. And then I went on to say that as if you go from the mouse to the monkey, what you see is that those connections get weaker and the number of areas gets possibly smaller. And that's something we want to look at in further detail. But what you could, you, what you could ask yourself is what happens when the brain gets much bigger still and you go to the human. And I think what happens there is those weak connections might get much weaker. <laughs> 
And I think that might go some way to explaining disconnection syndromes that you see in, in humans with things like Alzheimer's and what have you. So, yes, it's the relationship between weight and distance that, that leads to these long-distance weak connections. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Great talk. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. I have two questions, I mean, probably that are very related. I mean, the first one is very trivial. I mean, did you see in the functional connectivity matrix, for example, with fMRI or image or whatever, a, a similar exponential distance rule? So the the strength of the correlations decay oh, we, with the distance? Or? We, we haven't looked at that. We're, so we're not doing functional MRI. Yeah. So that would be something which would be interesting to look at. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't addressed that. Yeah, and and would make sense to look at that mm -hmm. from your point of view. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the second question is also related, and is uh, to look exactly at the same type of uh, exponential distance rules, but at the level of the effective connectivity matrix. Because coming more from a modeling uh, mm -hmm. world, I mean, what uh, the definition of of the strengths at the structural level for us. It's not so much uh, going in the direction of number of, of connections, but on the effectivity of those connections, on meaning the, yeah. on the effectivity, so meaning in biophysical terms, so the, the conductivity mm. of the synapses. Mm. That can be calculated, in the, of course, with some assumption in the framework of the model, mm. and it would be very nice to see if at the effectivity levels, uh, which is at the end what dynamically matters for the functions, such an exponential uh, law yeah. exists. Yeah. So, yes, the effective connectivity. So we have functional connectivity, we have structural connectivity. Functional connectivity is the response of areas in unison. So it can be because they're connected or it could be because they're having common input. And, and um, Professor Gustav Deco is asking about the effective connectivity, the capacity of one area to drive another area. Yes, I think that that's a, that's a very valid point, and I think that maybe uh, maybe coming back a little bit to a more uh, a more structural level, what I think would be very interesting, and it's possible to do, uh, is to see how the anterior connectivity, looking at the synapses, you can do that. The Allen Brain Institute people have done this. The Southern Californian people have done this. Andreas Burkhalter has done this, and see how that fits with the retrograde because you could find a discrepancy. In other words, the very long distance connection might have only one wire, but it might have 10 times more synapses at the end of it. So that could change things. And I think it would be extremely interesting to correlate or to see how the retrograde and the anterior grade do or do not come together. Just like that, it doesn't stand out to me as something very, um, we haven't made a proper study of that, but it, doesn't stand out as something really obviously different, but it's it's something which I think would would go in the direction that you're suggesting of looking at the uh, thinking about the effective connectivity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. First, thank you for this um, absolutely fascinating talk, and my question is about what drives what, uh, because we know that there are functional areas, and we know now that there's rules for connectivity, schemes for connectivity within the cortex. And if you're to sort of take an intelligent design kind of perspective, uh, because it's hard to figure out how the evolution occurs, but just say, why, why, are thing, why are functional regions located where they are? So you can think of maybe two opposing views. One is that because of the connectivity, it's an outcome of the connectivity that a region will be where it is. For instance, you could say, well, MT cortex, motion, perception, and so on, it's because of the convergence of, of a set of inputs due to their locations, an outcome of this convergence is a region in which neurons are sensitive to motion. Or as an alternative, you could say, well, the brain needs an area that's sensitive to motion, so let's move, uh, move this area into, uh, let's move this functional region into a place where it can receive the right kind of inputs. And I don't think it's a well-posed question, but I'd just like to hear your reflections on this. Um, OK, well, we, we haven't completed the analysis, but what we're going to be interested in looking at is if you have in the, in the, in the macaque 
compared to the mouse, so big compared to the small brain, do you have differences in the number of areas at different distances? If you do, it goes in the direction of thinking that you've, in the uh, more highly evolved macaque, and I don't like that term, but just you know what we mean. In, in the macaque, you've regrouped areas with similar functions better to have this stronger functional layout. So that would go in that direction. If, on the other hand, you find that there's no difference, and I, I really don't know at the moment, we haven't, we haven't done this yet, but if you find there's absolutely no difference, then it goes more in the sense that you know, that's the, the location is where you've got to be, and that's set in concrete, and that, that doesn't shift around that much. I, I think that it, that might be an approach, and it's certainly the questions that we want to ask. Yeah. So I, I have a question regarding uh, theory of uh, cortical function. And at the beginning of your talk, you, you have said that the reciprocity of the connectivity between areas is, is not always there. Mm. And I think things like predictive coding or, you know, Carl Friston's work, they, they put this as a very early assumption yes. on their theory. So you have to have that uh, otherwise. So have you comment? Or yeah. Do you have comments on this? Yeah, yes, I have. Uh, well, uh, so the predictive coding, I would like to have talked about that in, 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 in the thing. And I think it's a very interesting because it's, uh, it's really where you come back to this hierarchical processing. I mean, Carl does that very well in his papers. and and looks with great detail about what we know in terms of the anatomy and the physiology and, and has a huge respect for what's, for what's there. And as there's been so much credence given to this notion that things are, are bidirectional, that's sort of, um, sort of taken over. But we know, if you're interested in predictive coding, we know that there's a lot, and somebody asked a question a bit about this, I, I think it was Paul, we know that long-distance feedback connections are not reciprocated by long-distance feed-forward connections. Bag loads of evidence on that. So there's a whole flurry of areas which are not going to fit. The predictive coding guys are always talking about some ideal pair. They're never talking about the extreme ends of the, of the range when they're looking at hierarchy. So at the, if you look at a far-distance feed-forward and a far-distance feedback, the far distance feedback is not reciprocated by far distance feed forward. That's for sure. And they don't, they don't look at these, these two extreme ends. And I'm always wondering with the predictive coding, um, to, what extent, to what extent the feed forward and feedback can actually be switched. And, and I wonder if they're, if they're not thinking in terms of, uh, of something very, very rigid. If you look at the... Um, if you look at the work that Pascal Fries did where he took the structural hierarchy and mapped that on to a macaque that was doing behavioral uh, responses and then looked at the, co the oscillation and, and defined a functional, part, a functional network, a functional hierarchy, and then compared it to the structural hierarchy, and there was good agreement. But what's interesting is at different moments of the behavior, those positions switched dramatically. So what was feed forward in, at one stage became feedback at another stage with respect to two different areas. And that's in that paper. It's a 2015 neuron paper. And that dynamic switching, I think, is a consequence of, of the repertoire of areas which are coming into play to define the particular position of one area with respect to any other given area. So. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, I think this lady here has been uh, putting a hand up for some time. All right, here you go. Hi, um, sorry, I was wondering if you go back a little bit, because um, I didn't quite catch um, how you measured um, the coherence um, in the graphs. So, like, my first question would be, uh, why is the coherence negative in um, the graph with no connections? Because it seems to be quite strong, and then like the others seem to be built on like negative and positive kind of coherence levels. And I'm thinking maybe like because you talked about exceptions, and um, frankly, to me, I don't know like a negative. Um, oh, actually, a graph with no um, with no links will be quite a 
like a stable limit cycle, if you know what I mean. No, <laughs> tell me more. Um, <laughs> okay, so not here. I think in the mouse it was quite relevant. Uh, yeah. So yeah. in the first triangle, what's it? Um, you see those bars that go down? Here? Um, in this? the second bit. Yeah, in the bottom yeah. bit. Yeah. What are they measured in? Um, do you know? So it, do, it, it, I mean, it doesn't fully make sense to me, but yeah, because I just don't know what you did. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, so um, you're finding more. What we're looking at here is is how good this is the data. So there's a, a a small bar here, and the exponential distance rule and the constant distance rule, both of these random networks which we've been building, have been predicting more connect more of these types of motifs, that's to say, more sets of free areas which are not connected than actually you observe. That's what that, so this is a negative value and it, it tells you that the CDR does bad even worse than the EDR. Okay, so basically you don't know what happens in the brain in those areas that are not connected at all. No, you don't know what happens, but the frequency of absolutely unconnected sets of free areas you could take, two or four or five or what have you, but the frequency of that set is actually smaller than what you would predict. Okay, so you could come back to, you remember this one here? Yeah. This, this uh, thing here? If you, make a, if you do a, a random network, with, so you, you make a network and you've got no belief about anything, you actually get quite a few of these networks. Actually, when you look at the data, you get very, very few of them. So that sort of says brains don't like that. They, mm -hmm. they want to make sure that they don't get... They should have more. If you just connected things willy-nilly, you would get more, but you don't. And so the idea behind that is the brain doesn't like that. Uh, when you then look at the exponential distance rule, it, it slightly protects that better than the, than the, uh, than the uh, constant distance rule. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so I don't have any understanding about these unconnected areas, but they're, they're, they're relatively rare in sets of three. But it's the neocortex that doesn't like that, right? The brain, we don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. When asked about the um, connectivity matrix that you show at the beginning for yeah. the mouse brain, mm -hmm. you said you took this, you put it together from the Allen Brain Institute yeah. database and another database. Yes. So these databases have results that are not the same, saying like the same projection site, you have a volume of tracer in the projection site that are different, right? Yes. So how do you, do you combine these experiments into one matrix would be one question. And the second one is if you can extract any directionality from these experiments. Can you, sorry? If you can extract any directionality or direction information from these experiments. Okay, so um, the questions concerning uh, the legality, if you like, or how, how, or how you did it. How, how we did it, but okay, <laughs> it's another, it's being implied about the legality. So what we've done is we've taken, we've been careful about collated data, after all, this, is, this has plagued the issue of density of connections. So we've taken the Allen Brain Institute and the Southern Californian, published in the same year, they used basically the same atlas with tiny little exceptions. By the way, the atlas doesn't take on board all the subdivisions which are known, uh, mostly in the visual system according to Burkhalter who, by the way, I should have thanked here. He, he's been hugely important in this data. So we, 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 we simply put connected, not connected. I haven't, there is some weighted data in the Allen Brain Institute we, which we haven't, we haven't used. We haven't, we haven't used that data. We've just connected, not connected. So that's, that's what we've done there. And the second question was... About directionality. These experiments allow you to allow you to infer some directionality of these yeah. connections. Yeah, so yeah. that's part of the matrix. That's, that's, uh, they, they're connected, they're, the database they publish is directional. In other words, they say A goes to B, and does B go back to A? Right. Yes, it does, no, it doesn't. By the way, they report, uh, Allen Brain Institute reports a number of unidirectional care connections in, in the mouse. And so we've collapsed the two databases. We believe, when we do that, that each, each study had a small number of false negatives, and um, we, we believe they haven't got any false positives, but the studies are pretty well, are very, are very thorough, and they're using very 
careful techniques. Hi, thank you for the nice talk and for the nice talk last evening. But uh, it's only a curiosity. What could be the impact of studying these metrics in the context of nonlinear dynamic system? That means you see the, the evolution of the connectivity as a, let's say, a complex system that evolves in time instead of using a statistical uh, analysis. Uh, that means it's, it's it methodological, it's differently. And uh, I'm curious about it, what could be the results of the, if you have applied this kind of methodology instead of you using statistical analysis. Um, I'm not sure I completely follow the question. It, it's uh, nonlinear dynamics. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. Uh, for example, the connectivity you have been studied, you have treated the matrix as in terms of um, connectivity as a graph, okay? Yes. But you can interpret the connections as a dynamic system. Yes. So that leads you, uh, using another methodology to evaluate, like the eigenvalues of the matrix and yeah. the contraction of the matrix in the space they, they are defined. Yeah. This is, is a speculative mathematical uh, question. Uh, that means, yeah, 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 yeah. Instead of that means it would be interesting or to be have an impact. Or there's no mean. It is okay. Maybe um, I mentioned that we're collaborating with Chao Jing Wang, and he's been interested in in modeling the, uh, the 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 cortex and using and using this data for using this interaerial connectivity and the. And above all, this similarity of connectivity and probability of connectivity is two independent variables. When he does that, he's interested in the, so he has a firing, he has a, a firing system, it's a dynamic system, and he's imposing on it the connectivities we've been looking at. And this shows that you get a temporal window that goes from a very, very brief window in sensory areas and gets progressively, progressively enlarged, uh, increased as you go to more frontal areas. And when you when you change the connectivity, when you interfere with the connectivity, you, you disrupt that, that, uh, that temporal window, which could easily be an explanation of working memory, for example, in, in front frontal areas, which is much more extensive than it is in, in, in sensory areas where things are, uh, are dealt with over very short temporal windows. So it's, it's work we've collaborated with, but it's, uh, and it's, it's coming out. It's going to be published in your own in, in a... In a, in a couple of, it's accepted. I don't know how long it takes. All right, fantastic. Henry, thank you very much. Thank you.